you can start. Great. So welcome, everybody. Um, you are here at the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing uh, webinar. And our topic this afternoon is on capitalizing on technology solutions in affordable housing. And we're gonna talk about opportunities to help us reap the gains for residents and building operators. Uh, my name is Davis Park, and I am the um, Vice President of the Front Porch Center for Innovation and Wellbeing. And Front Porch itself is a nonprofit uh, provider of senior services and housing across California. Uh, we uh, manage 54 communities and represent about 10,000 lives every day. Um, and I'll be your panel moderator. Next. So um, what we, who we have today, we've got experts in their respective fields who are gonna be talking about this topic about technology solutions um, from the resident perspective and for, for the, for, from an operator and uh, provider perspective. And we have Tim Kohut, who is a director of sustainable design and national, at, at, at national community renaissance. We have David Sonnier, who is founder and partner of CentraTech, and we have Chris Berger, who is a technology program manager at EA, EAH Housing. So I'd like to welcome all of our panelists here today. And um, just a little uh, housekeeping item. If you have questions, um, we're gonna hold them towards the end. And uh, we encourage you to use the chat box and we're gonna be collecting the questions um, and uh, bringing them up uh, for the last 10 minutes or so of, of our panelists. So um, without further, further ado, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Tim and just to kind of give you a little bit of background about Tim. Um, Tim is actually, uh, 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 he and I had worked together for, for quite some time, a long time ago, but uh, he currently is a director of sustainable uh, design at National Community Renaissance which provides award-winning affordable housing paired with best practice and social service programs that's tailored to help families move towards self-sufficiency and ultimately to home ownership. And over, uh, for over more than two decades, CORE has built and renovated needed housing for tens of thousands of people. And Tim uh, works with the National CORE's construction team to identify strategies and approaches for fully integrating energy efficiency, sustainability, and high performance goals into company standardized means, methods, and programming documents. So Tim, it's Excellent, thanks, Davis. You, you, you nailed that. I wish you would just continue to keep doing my presentation for me. Um, and great connecting with you again after all these years, Davis. Uh, great to see you're out there still doing good work. Uh, really quickly, uh, I'm Tim Kohut. My, uh, my title at National Corps is Director of Sustainable Design. Uh, I'm an architect, I'm an energy analyst, and uh, energy, and cost, uh, cost containment uh, and operational uh, energy costs are really what, what drive uh, me passionately. And as we look towards current code requirements and rebate programs, things like that, um, really uh, uh, it, it's, it's uncharted territory that we're just getting used to. Uh, next slide, Olivia. We are a developer, uh, we are a builder. Uh, if you click the next one, yeah, I work for the construction team. And uh, once we build our projects, uh, we develop, we build, uh, so we control the design and construction process and we control conversations specific to energy and ultimately technology. Next slide. Then we, uh, when we uh, finish our projects, we manage them, own them, and we also provide uh, resident services. You can click the next tab, Olivia. So uh, really quickly, go ahead to the next one, Olivia. Uh, our commitment to sustainability, I, I can't frame or start any conversation without really talking about energy efficiency or sustainability. Uh, we are all in. Uh, we like to stay near the front of conversation when it comes to uh, the changing energy code and the changing rebate programs because we want to make sure that we can understand these, inform our teams, and really do our utmost to contain costs and deliver the highest performing projects that we can. We were the uh, first uh, developer, we're the only affordable housing developer on the US GBC's power builder list. We did that two years in a row, a distinction that is uh, bestowed by US GBC for those who are going above and beyond on just normal lead projects. 
We are also the first non-architectural entity to sign on to the AIA 2030 commitment. Uh, the 2030 commitment basically uh, sets goals uh, and requires us to track our progress towards zero net energy for all of our projects by 2030. So we're happy to be a participant in that. What drives conversation today uh, in, in, uh, in California and much of the world beyond the energy code, I am convinced is economics. And I put this slide up here just to give to sort of segue into future slides. Um, this is uh, a, a um, graph known as the Swanson curve. And it basically says every time that worldwide uh, uh, production potential to, to make uh, photovoltaic um, uh, energy systems or panels, doubles, the cost for buying those systems drops by 20%. And it's, it's a really interesting graph and it's very academic. Uh, but when you are buying solar, you know, for every project year in and year out, and you're seeing this actually happening, it is really, really exciting. So uh, we get to see this on every project. We buy more solar, the price goes down. We are way below what we would call grid parity, the point at which buying electricity from your own rooftop is cheaper than it is to buy from the, from the local utilities. So this, the economics really drive uh, a lot of our conversations these days and we'll kind of cue into some of the points I wanna make. Next slide. This is a project, uh, this is what z &E looks like. We, we kind of dove into zero net energy projects uh, a couple years before the current code cycle, which requires all uh, low rise residential buildings, three stories and less to be zero net energy. This is San Isidro Senior Village down uh, uh, on the border with Mexico, South San Diego County, 51 units of housing for the formerly homeless. And you could see a very showy rooftop PV system. Um, and uh, this was our first foray into really diving deeply and understanding the economics. And I'll come back to this in just a second. Next slide. This is uh, Day Creek Villas, uh, 140 units of senior out in Rancho Cucamonga, finished last October. This was under the 2016 energy code, but we again dove in deep on renewable energy systems. Uh, and this is as a 410 kW PV system. We anticipate our electricity bills are going to be a couple thousand dollars, two or three thousand dollars worth of, of time of use energy. And our resident utility bills are going to be between five and ten dollars a month, which we pass on the savings on to them. Next slide. And that's what that looks like. This is what, what new buildings look like in the era of the current energy code. Um, and why is this important? Well, or what are our goals? Go, go to the next slide, Olivia. What we're trying to do uh, in each project, and we start this at, at the very beginning, is to balance rooftop uh, electricity with our demand. And this is San Isidro Senior Village. That first slide, I showed 51 units of uh, housing for the formerly homeless. And you can see we're at about 90% uh, of our energy is being met, uh, electricity, electricity is being met by that rooftop solar system. And we would like to get this a little bit tighter, a little bit higher, but we ran out of roof space on this. When you do this, the key is not necessarily having, you know, full green circles and being, you know, proud that you're doing all this. The, the real key point comes when you look at the operational uh, uh, economics of this. Go to the next slide. So here's, here's the after budget on this. You can see that our, uh, our and the lower right-hand side, and if you cue the next slide, it will blow up for us a little bit. There you go. So our, our end electricity cost for this master metered project is um, $9,200. That's gonna be our annual uh, budget for electricity. And the savings on this is gonna be somewhere in the vicinity of $47,000 per year. Um, cue the next click once and then you'll see that show up. There it is, that's our annual savings. And go to the next slide. Why is this important? Because if you look at that $47,000 uh, over time, we have flattened our electricity costs, whereas other people who are still tied to the electricity grid are going to see their uh, electricity costs escalate over time. $47,000 a year in savings in the life of a 30 year loan. Uh, with 51 units of housing is about $2 million worth of savings. Go ahead and click the next, uh, there you go. And one more time, Olivia, there you go, $2 million. So uh, I'll get come back to that, $2 million worth of operational savings because we figured out a way to, uh, no, you can keep going, Olivia. $2 million because we figured out how to control those conversations up front and land enough PV on our building. 
Um, we're also taking a very deep look into our existing portfolio. We track our energy and we go wise. Go ahead and click the next couple bullets. There's a couple bullets here. We spend about $1.2 million in electricity per year, uh, $648,000 in natural gas. And uh, one more, there you go, 3.2 million on water. Uh, the electricity and gas is something that we can do about, and we are starting to do something about this. Go ahead to the next slide. So we are leveraging uh, somewhere in the vicinity of $20 million worth of rebate. You can load everything here, Olivia. And two more clicks, there you go. Uh, $20 million worth of rebate funding, 15 megawatts of solar is what we're putting on our buildings now to get our common area electricity costs down by about 40%, uh, reducing our, our resident uh, utility bills for electricity down to near zero. You know, they'll pay the, the metering fee, uh, you know, which is gonna be five to $10 a month, but we're doing this throughout our entire portfolio. As we deploy these systems, it's not just land PV on the buildings. And this is where the conversations about energy efficiency and sustainability really ties into data and internet connectivity. When we drop these systems onto our buildings, we need to know and understand how they're performing almost in real time. Click the next slide. So for us, it is really about the internet of things. When we're looking at our buildings and they're perform the way they perform. This is San Isidro village, Senior Village. And we dropped in these energy curbs so that we could actually see where the energy is going in real time so we could understand that the building is operating correctly. And I can't do this without that internet connection. I need to be able to wire our energy systems into a good uh, Wi-Fi system to be able to capture this because we want to make sure that the commitments we make towards energy really pay off. And it's not just this is electricity and you see those uh, those mountain shaped curves, this is a daily profile for seven days. And the orange bars there are your lighting, which goes kind of on and off at night. Uh, the uh, sort of lime green is the elevator. The blue is your HVAC. And then you get some plug loads at the very bottom, the darker green and the purple. And you can see if we're doing this correctly, we're spending about $300 uh, a month in electricity. So um, pretty, pretty good at this particular moment, a little, little snapshot in time. Click on the next one. So at the same time, when we deploy PV, you, you have to make sure that you're getting good dashboard uh, information. So uh, we have standardized our, uh, our inverters on our PV systems to make sure that we're able to monitor all of the electricity coming off of our rooftops in a single location. And again, we need this internet connectivity to make sure that these systems are hitting the target. So the same inverter, the same sort of system to read this data and then internet connectivity to see this. And it's not just energy, that, that whole chart that I showed initially, $3.2 million worth of water, you can't do a whole lot with, with water. Click the next one, Olivia. But we've started to deploy uh, toilet leak sensors. We found that a lot of uh, what we spend and waste in our projects actually goes into toilet leaks. So we've started to look at this, and these are uh, this is one project where you can actually see where we're monitoring. This is a couple of projects, but a couple of them where you see red our problems where we have issues with toilet leaks. It's a stuck valve or a leaky flapper valve or something like that. We need to be able to see this in real time. And, and this is again, how the building and how what the residents use inside their building suddenly impact your bottom line. This does not work without the internet connectivity. Click on the next slide, please. And this is one of those, uh, this, those, those, uh, those slides or uh, one of the, uh, the units where you can see this is a single stuck leak. That And the beauty of this is when we put the sensor in, it will email us uh, out immediately that there's a problem with this. So we can actually dispatch with sort of surgical precision into the unit to make sure that we're taking care of this. Data and real-time information is the key to driving this because if we do this correctly and we actually do save that $2 million over 30 years, the question is what can we do with that $2 million worth of savings? We would like to subsidize transportation. Maybe we subsidize internet for our residents. Uh, you know, let's try to make, uh, you know, affordability for internet connectivity, a reality for everybody. So we're just starting the journey now. I, I have much more I could say about equity issues, but I know we've got some really great panelists and David and Chris who are going to talk about stuff like that. So I will stop there and hand it off. Great, thanks, Tim. Um, I have some a whole bunch of questions <laughs> that that came out of. of
your presentation. I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, and, and now we are uh, bumping it over to David Sonnier. He is the founder and senior vice president of CenterTech, which brings smart technology to housing nationwide. Uh, CenterTech focuses on outcomes, top-notch networks, increased energy efficiency, lower resident turnover, better resident services, and a platform for the future of technology innovation in the home. Under David's leadership um, in the various organizations and businesses he's, he's been um, affiliated with, uh, One Economy, for example, he and I had actually been quite some time ago um, working under the same roof. He has designed and produced award-winning award -winning sites visited by millions of visitors. His specialties are in art, editorial, and web development, direction, and management. He also has extensive experience in nonprofit management, web design, architecture, and he specializes in usability and user experiences. And his sites have received awards from USA Today, Yahoo, and the Department of Labor, the Tellies, and the Webbies. David? Thanks, Davis, um, and thank you, uh, Tim. I, I, I kind of feel like whoever, whatever talk show host follows Oprah on the day she just gave cars to everyone in the audience with that $2, $2 million <laughs> savings uh, we're talking about there and everything. But I, I, I think that's fantastic, super interesting, and, and thank you for queuing, queuing some of this conversation up. Um, if, if there's a topic that is in, in the world of housing and particularly the low-income housing, if there's a topic that uh, rivals or is even more on the minds of folks these days than energy efficiency, I think it's it's got to be affordable broadband, bringing broadband to everyone in this country. Obviously, this past year um, has, has really highlighted um, the acute need for that, and I'm sure everyone um, attending this uh, session today has has been thinking about that at one time or another for for the residents living in the properties they're working on and and so on um, and so I want to sort of introduce you to to Century Tech and the work that we do um, as as Davis mentioned it's it's sort of a, a new incarnation of of an older organization One Economy Corporation which was founded back in 2000 which which at the time when we were talking about bringing broadband into the homes of, of low-income residents, uh, it, was, it was a much much more difficult argument to make, as you can imagine, 21 years ago. But <clears throat> excuse me, nowadays that, that argument is certainly being, being made um, in, in, in a lot of different venues. So I, I wanna introduce you to the work that we do and, and really as a means to provide some, some context about opportunities um, <clears throat> for all of you as, as low-income housing developers, resident services managers, uh, property managers, and so on. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, again, we don't really have to spend much time making the argument these days. Uh, we, we, a lot of us have heard the stats. We, we, we know the stats vis-a-vis -vis the digital divide. Sometimes we talk about uh, 30 million people disconnected, a third of the country, half of low-income Americans don't have connectivity. A number we throw out is a, is a much bigger number, and it's a number about who doesn't use broadband. So it, that includes places where there may be uh, connections available, um, but they're not being uh, taken advantage of because they're too expensive, um, it's, it's, it's spotty, or they're just, you know, there are other challenges that are preventing adoption of broadband. Um, our country has, has left it primarily in the hands of the uh, private sector uh, to provide broadband uh, everywhere. And, and obviously, as a for-profit with shareholders, these companies are disincentivized uh, to, to, to build out in rural locations where where incomes are lower and it's much more expensive to deploy um, in, in low income urban communities where, where the, the, the take rate of their 80 or 90 or even higher uh, dollar per month uh, costs is, is, is not, you know, it does not make sense for them to, to do the full deployment. Um, next slide, please. But, but at Century Tech, the way we like to think about this is, is we really don't even use the term digital divide very much, despite it showing up right here on this screen, because we, 
we really think that that doesn't cover it. The, 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 um, the issue at play is not about making sure there is a physical connection going to every household in America. While universal broadband is absolutely necessary and absolutely the goal, um, our point of view is, is one of what we call digital advancement and, and making sure that this isn't about technology for technology's sake. This is about what can be done with technology. And, and Tim highlighted one you know, super important use of, of internet infrastructure and what that can do in terms of uh, monitoring and energy efficiency vis-a-vis -vis the internet of things. But so at Century Tech, our approach, you know, sort of in, includes this deployment of broadband infrastructure and IoT, but also the increasing of adoption of broadband infrastructure through life enhancing programs uh, and uses of technology. Uh, next, Olivia, please. So, so this diagram is sort of um, obviously an oversimplified uh, diagram that shows some of the typical uses and, and how we approach this infrastructure. And one, one key thing that I want to point out here is that um, our approach to bro providing broadband for low-income Americans uh, through low-income housing, in low-income housing, is by creating property-owned network infrastructure. When, it, when, it, when things get really expensive for residents, it's when we're doing one-offs and, and folks are being asked to pay that $80, $90, $100 a month you know, per unit, per family uh, charge to, to one of the major telcos. But, but if we can create the network infrastructure throughout a building one time and share a, a very wide broadband pipe among all of the residences through Wi-Fi connectivity, some wired connectivity and so on, then we can drive down the costs dramatically uh, for residents. Um, to afford that connectivity. And so in this diagram, you're sort of looking at all the stuff in blue is stuff, is, is equipment that is owned at the property level, owned by the developer owner of the housing. So really all we're doing is funneling in broadband uh, to the curb. And then from there, uh, we're, we're distributing that internet connectivity to all the floors. Again, wired connectivity sometimes in, in common areas. Um, you see where we're powering IoT devices, uh, which can be bundled together. Uh, Wi-Fi connectivity brings connectivity to all, all the units. Uh, there's many ways to do this from a hardware uh, standpoint. You can, you can wire every unit if you're doing new construction. You can put Wi-Fi routers in every single unit. Uh, some of these things, some of the simpler ways to do it are, you know, in the, hall, in the hallway Wi-Fi connectivity so that if something goes wrong with a piece of hardware, you're not having to enter somebody's unit uh, and that sort of thing. You also see on the roof here, this 5G cell tower, it's, it's in black because that's provider owned as well. A very popular revenue generating source uh, once a building has the network infrastructure in place is to lease out rooftops. If we can squeeze in a little space uh, next to Tim's uh, PV on the roof, uh, we can lease out a little space to put a 5G cell tower in there and, and, and the building owner gets revenue from that every month. So, you know, our work, we sort of work with the general contractors and owners to, to do a network assessment, see what's necessary, right? be it new construction, be it rehab, or even be it, uh, an existing uh, building where we want to bring in uh, broadband. Uh, do the hardware installation. Again, it can be it can be done during build out or, or, or very low impact for existing buildings. And then, and then you know, advance the, the community connectivity. Um, residents will get high speed, dependable broadband connections um, with no ISP contracts that they are responsible for paying uh, themselves. Next slide, Olivia. But as, as we said a couple of slides ago, our work doesn't stop just with the technology um, we, we, we really want to make sure that adoption of the technology is, is present and folks are really able to take advantage of what this offers. Um, and so a lot of our other wraparound programming, we have a for-profit uh, part of our business and a nonprofit part of our business. And a nonprofit part of the business really focuses on this resident impact, these resident impact activities. So even during the build-out phase, when we're putting in 
wiring and devices and hardware and all of that kind of stuff. This presents opportunities for residents to get on the job, high tech skill training, apprenticeship opportunities, um, workforce development opportunities to help with the actual build out. Um, that, that also, we, we also can train folks up to become um, sort of technology ambassadors in the, in the buildings, in the housing developments and, and help um, with other residents, uh, digital skill development. A digital integrator program that, that, that we are developing is all about workforce digital skills training and matching with high skill jobs in the workforce. And so we recognize that, again, just lighting up units with, with connectivity is not necessarily the end game here. And, and, and we work hard to wrap around a lot of programming and services to help facilitate people's uh, comfort and, and, and adoption of that technology. Next, please. So, so the financials, um, you know, obviously when there's a build out, there's gonna be capital expenditures. And when there is ongoing uh, broadband be coming to the building, there are operational expenditures. Um, but there, there, you know, there are ways that bring those costs down dramatically. Certainly when we're talking about new construction and you do wiring at the same time as other electrical work, low voltage work and so on, the, the, the costs are, are, are minimal. But the value of having um, the connectivity in the unit certainly can help with tenant retention, much like Tim talked about, if I, if I can live in a place with five to $10 uh, uh, energy bills versus $150 energy bills, you know, that, that, makes, that has a lot to do with it. If I can live in a place with free or, or very affordable internet connectivity versus having to go out on my own, uh, that, that makes a big difference in, in retention. Uh, the utility costs, I don't need to go into that, but, but certainly with internet of things uh, that Tim talked about, leak sensors, uh, automatic lighting and, and, and so on, uh, there's opportunity for utility cost reduction. Same with uh, labor costs and property values go up as a result. Uh, uh, next, please. So um, there, there are a lot of different models in terms of the build out, a lot of different models in terms of the finances and, and how to reduce CapEx. Uh, there's different models, you know, are you going to pass along any of the operational expenses of, of the broadband to residents? Are you gonna take it all on yourself? What can you recoup uh, from, from uh, offering streaming services on top of that? Uh, from offering, uh, for, from putting the cell phone tower on the roof and so on. We have financial models that show an actual return on investment over five to 10 years as well. So this doesn't just have to be a cost sink. And certainly if, if, if folks are realizing the kinds of savings that Tim's talking about, that can go a long way to helping pay for this kind of activity. Um, but I will, I, I will stop there and, and uh, look forward to some questions at the end. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Thanks. And I, and I think that, you know, you, part of what you talked about touches on a really, really important part of addressing the digital divide, addressing digital inclusion programs, which is the adoption part. Um, and so Chris is going to dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, and uh, uh, an introduction to Chris, he is the technology program manager at EAA. H Housing, EAH Housing, which is a nonprofit corporation that was founded with the belief that attractive, affordable housing is a cornerstone of to vibrant, sustainable communities. It was established in 1968 and has become one of the largest and most respected nonprofit housing development and management organizations in the Western United States. And it's developed 92 properties and manages 9,800 leases in 50 municipalities throughout California and Hawaii. Uh, from analog to digital, Chris thrives in the electronic communications field, whether on the microphone, uplifting the soul in the classroom, touching the heart, motivating the body and stimulating the brain. He believes the gifts given should be shared and then some. Closing the digital divide, both in access and opportunity is his passion. As the great Chuck D say, says, each one teach one. Chris. Thank you, Davis. That's from a song called Rise and Shine. Um, yeah, from Oprah to Scott Van Pelt. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, David. So we want to uh, get into a little case study of what we've done at EH Housing. And um, let's go ahead and start with the first one, Olivia. 
So uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this photo. It's of the uh, two students in Salinas, California during the pandemic trying to get uh, access to their school classes on their Chromebooks in front of a Taco Bell. So just look at that picture and, and, and kind of let it hit you. Um, when we say a roof is just the beginning at EAH housing, um, it, it kind of rings a little more true in this photo where these two students were also housing insecure at the time. And of course, through technology, a GoFundMe started and, you know, 100K later, they were they're housing secure and they got their hot spot through the through the school district. But that's just a little indication and evidence of what we're dealing with right now in terms of the digital divide. Uh, let's go to the next. So a little quote from a uh, Harvard uh, professor and chairman of the Department of Social and Behavior Sciences. If you look down uh, at those three points by the bottom, uh, community wellness and community health with a sense of community spirit, accessible, affordable housing and, and education. I, I talk a lot about the network. Now the network could be two things, right? The network when we're talking about broadband, but the, the human network. And if you look in this photo, I'm over here on the top right with some graduates from our digital literacy program. And in the center in the front is the previous technology program manager who now works for another affordable housing. And so I always like being on this panel today, meeting with the other folks, being part of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, constantly, sharing best practices and stories and resources is important because the digital navigators and ambassadors, it's always so important to uh, align with each other and share those, uh, those resources. Let's go to the next one. I'm gonna get a little into the intro of what our program is at EAH, some of the sites and our vendors partners, uh, the devices we use along with the curriculum, some KPIs and some success stories. Let's go to the next one, please. So I like to look at it uh, when we're talking about the digital literacy curriculum and what we're doing is uh, the Spanish word for river, rios, right? And the R would be resources, I for information. Uh, we want people to have access to opportunity, which is the O, and then access to services. So this is the river of di digital li literacy and of course a river snakes and the extra S would be for secure. So if you could imagine having a wallet and you're on, for me, I'm in Oakland, so we use BART and it's our public transportation. If I just took my wallet, threw it on a seat and just hope it was there at the end of the, the day, that's kind of like putting your information online. And so we wanna be really mindful about uh, keeping our residents' personal identifiable information secure and really hone in on that aspect of the curriculum. Let's go to the next one, please. So, a lot of people talk about the the golden uh, the, uh, the 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 stool right of digital literacy, the pillars, and so what what does that involve? Access to affordable and effective broadband, internet capable devices, the training and tech support, and curriculum that addresses the needs of the learners. And we spoke about digital workforce training before, and that would be introducing to the uh, Windows Office Suite, introducing to the Google Office Suite, what, what's gonna help them train up for a job. And then also one of the most important parts is fostering community, neighbors assisting neighbors. Uh, we look at the team. If I look at the team at EAH, it started with Mary Murtaugh, who started our first di digital literacy program. She's our board chair, Laura Hall, our CEO, who's been more than supportive, Gianno Ma, our VP of IT who's helped with all the infrastructure, Kristen Taylor, our Director of Resident Services, and of course, all our teams. Let's go to the next one. So you could call it the stool, or you call it the golden triangle. Starts with technology. What kind of device are they using? What's the process, right? What's the curriculum? And then where are you after they learn the course, right? We, we wanna have continued support for folks. And then the people, we talk about the residents, our staff, our leadership, instructors, and our partners. Let's go to the next one. These are uh, 23 sites on the left. You'll see our, our, through our previous digital literacy program, we finished that in December of 2020. And we're currently on the five on the right. And then we just got approved funding for an additional eight. And so we're getting CPUC funds through the CASF grant, but also we're matching with funds through our organization. Let's go to the next one, please. This is our, our vendor partner for our curriculum, LearnerWeb, uh, for our previous grant. And um, they were basing a lot of the curriculum off the North Star Digital Literacy out of Minnesota. Let's go to the next one. And our current partner is Urban Equity Group. Uh, this is our, our instructors. We're able to teach in uh, 
Mandarin and Spanish and English. And they also provide our devices. So we're using Android tablets currently and previously we use uh, uh, laptops. Uh, next one, please. So this just goes a, a little of the process. We, we want to do a pre, we do outreach, registration, do a pre-survey to see where the resident is in terms of their technical savvy. And then put them in the proper cohort. Uh, they get awarded the, the device after either in-class training with the hybrid of online training. Of course, for the last year, it's been all online and over the phone. And then they graduate get awarded the device, and then they get their diploma, and then we'll, we try to have a, a celebration for them. Next one. Just a, a couple sample of uh, some of the, you know, we talk about cybersecurity, how to protect their information. Uh, we all know DuckDuckGo as opposed to Chrome or Safari, uh, and Firefox in terms of keeping your information private. Night Night is a great uh, site. Have I been pawned to see if your email has been uh, uh, in a breach, virus total to check on PDFs or other URLs that you might seem fishy to you. Let's go to the next one. And then how to read an email, right? Phishing emails. Next one. Woman on the left, she's one of our students. This has to, uh, this deals with how do you do the outreach? How do you get people engaged? And I was a cable guy for 15 years and I was door to door and running teams and we always had the same, what's in it for me, right? With them. And how do you speak to the individual and get them engaged? And so Florence on the left, that's her graduation diploma. She wasn't interested in the class at all. But I asked her, what did she like to do in life? And she said, contact her sister. So one FaceTime, one Google Meet, one Zoom later, and she was hooked and now she's a graduate. Um, these are some of our students on the right side. I had another one of our properties, graduation party. Let's go to the next one. Our KPIs, 13 graduates in the last three years, add another 100 this year. So we have 1,400, uh, of course, 1,400 laptops and tablets awarded. 30% of the total population of all 28 sites have had digital literacy. And then we're in process of actually getting eight additional sites because they didn't have enough money for all 16. Let's go to the next one. Ah, uh, B. B was one of our students in San Pablo uh, near Richmond, California. She had a bunch of scraps of paper with, uh, she's a fashion designer. So this is the exact moment where we got all her contacts from her emails on a, on a Google contact list. And she sent out the, uh, the, the blast. But just in, in the distance, you'll see a, a bulletin board. And this is where we post some of our flyers in the common area. And these are two of our public facing computers. Uh, move on to the next one, please. Virginia Silk, she and I have a date tomorrow to, to do some more tech work. 94 years old, 94 years young. And this is during, uh, you know, shelter in place. And, you know, I, I had to go down and help her out one on one. And you'll see the door open in the distance. You know, we had our six feet, but, you know, this is part of that continued tech support that we want to show for our folks. Next one, please. And then this individual, uh, Lori, she was one of our students that she had a really hard upbringing. And through the program, she got the confidence. Let's go to the next one. And she was able to become a painter. And she, I actually own this painting now. She gave it to me. Uh, let's go to the next one. And just some more success stories. Uh, it's, the, I would say with this program, you know, we wanna highlight all the great things and uh, outcomes of it. But the fact is we have to keep the network alive. We have to keep the funding in place. We have to continue to share best practices. Get emergency broadband.org starts in one week on the 12th where people can get $50 off their internet service and $100 reimbursed on the device. So through this, we're gonna have more smiles. Next slide. And that would be the last one. How does it affect our residents? Well, they were now able to do their school and that last fall during the pandemic. And that's all I got. Amazing stories and amazing work, Chris. Um, I, I did not know a whole lot about EA, EAH housing before before we met, but uh, truly transformational. And I think that that um, really speaks to the adoption piece. That's that's so important. It's really not just about the hard infrastructure when we talk about the pipes and we talk about the access points and bringing in the broadband cable or fiber, but it's also the soft infrastructure too. And you, you, you and your teams 
clearly represent that that really uh, critical element in, in what what we're all trying to achieve and aspire to. Um, so I, I wanted to take a couple minutes to go through some uh, current and upcoming legislative and, and policy uh, um, items that that may be worth um, putting onto your radar and. Uh, I want to first go through some state legislative um, uh, proposals and, and bills. And I just want to kind of also preface and uh, draw a disclaimer here um, that these that these legislative uh, uh, items are uh, have been curated by SCAMP. Um, and so I'm essentially uh, helping to, to kind of share some of the, the things that the policy team has come up with. AB 1425, uh, the California Emerging Technology Fund, um, it's uh, aiming to achieve no less than 98% of households in each consortia region having access to broadband internet by December 31st, 2022. It's going to look to, uh, it's seeking to achieve California state's ability to obtain federal funds by administering what's known as the California Advanced Services Fund to support broadband infrastructure. And beginning in January 1st, it's gonna, there's going to be a transfer, if this bill passes, of $25 million to the broadband public housing account to provide grants um, and support connectivity needs. It's going to in, uh, encourage collaboration among California stakeholders promote, to promote public-private partnerships, um, as well as a few other requirements in order for you to participate participate in that program. AB 14 and SB 4 is um, known as, uh, actually, I don't know what the title is, but it's it's designed to provide funding and bonding capacity for statewide investment in infrastructure and high-speed internet access for all. It's going to prioritize internet connectivity to Californians in both rural and urban areas, and it's going to authorize collection of an existing surcharge on revenues collected by telecom providers from customers. And the funding is gonna be coming from surcharges from the California Advanced Services Fund, which provides rural and urban communi communities with grants administered by the California Public Utilities Commission. And SB4, Senate Bill 4, similarly would implement changes in the CASF program and it's gonna authorize the ongoing collection of the CASF surcharge, which is gonna be capped at 23 cents per month per access line. Um, and AB 34, known as the Broadband for All Act of 2022 or Internet for All Act of 2021, is going to authorize bonds in the amount of $10 billion to the state general obligation bond law to support the 2022 Broadband for All program. And it's going to be administered by the Department of Technology to provide financial assistance for projects to deploy broadband infrastructure and broadband internet access. And just a really quick update on the California Public Utilities Commissions, which um, really manages a lot of these programs and also administers the California Advanced Services Fund. Um, it's going to funding for installation, broadband installation was retired at the end of 2020. Um, and $20 million to date had gone into this work. The CASF program was heavily utilized in its first few years, but it wasn't favored by cable companies who intentionally made it rough for a nonprofit organization to apply for funding. Um, and in, from 2015 to 16 um, were the peak years of the program and future funding is not out of question and there's a possibility of renewal. Can we go to the next slide? And I wanna kind of uh, now touch very briefly on some federal level legislation that's gonna impact some of this work that we've all been talking about. And the American Rescue Plan is, is uh, slated to bring affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband to every American, uh, including the more than 35% of rural Americans who are left behind. Um, and it's going to it's going to set some minimally acceptable broadband speeds. It's going to provide 1.9 trillion dollars in mandatory funding um, through uh, program changes and tax policies, and it's going to introduce the Emergency Connectivity Fund, which provides 7.2 billion dollars to reimburse schools and libraries for providing free broadband service 
and connected devices for students and, and patrons to use in their homes. Um, and the FCC emergency broadband benefit, this is something that, uh, that Chris actually um, referenced in, in his presentation, also known as the EBB. It's a benefit of the SEC program. You may have heard of it, and uh, there's been spinning a lot of news, and it was designed to help families and households in particular um, who are struggling to afford internet service during the COVID pandemic. Um, it's going to provide a discount of up to $50 per month towards broadband service for, for eligible households and up to $75 for households on qualifying tribal lands. Um, there's also going to be a $100 benefit or a discount in order for uh, families and households to purchase a device, desktop computer or tablet um, with participating providers. If they contribute more than $10 and less, then would they contribute more than 10 and less than 50 towards the purchase price. Um, you can go to the FCC website and do a really quick Google search. You'll find some information about it. Um, what I do know about this program really quickly is that it's really not designed for providers. Um, and uh, for those of us who are operating affordable housing and want our residents to benefit from this, um, we would essentially need to help individuals sign up to be able to take advantage of this. I'm not, I don't think that the application is quite out yet. I believe it's gonna be released in, in a couple days, uh, pretty soon. Um, and it, it is a limited fund and they, they uh, estimate it'll probably be exhausted by August. That's what I know. Um, and then finally, the Biden infrastructure plan of 2021 is uh, going to set aside $100 billion to connect uh, every American to high-speed broadband internet over the next five, eight years. Um, and 100% broadband coverage by the end of the decade. And uh, it's going to also encourage adoption um, by reducing the cost of internet service long-term. Um, and this is part of that soft infrastructure that we've talked about before. So last slide. So we want to turn it over to, to uh, back to the panelists. If we can come back and see you all. Um, and we have a question here. Oh, it looks like it was just answered, but um, one question, and, and in fact, I'm gonna turn this over to someone from SCAMF um, possibly, but is AB1425 the spiritual successor of AB 1299 and the much maligned AB 1665? That's pretty wonky for me. <laughs> Jeanette or Olivia, would you happen to know the answer to that? I don't, but we can look into that. Okay, are you going to distribute to all the members, the answer to the members um, after the, the webinar? Yes, we'll be distributing the slides as well as the recording and any other questions that come up. Okay, great. Um, a question for Chris, does EAH also serve San Diego? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I answered that in the uh, chat. We are currently only in LA, um, Bay Area, Central Valley, and Hawaii, and we hope to be in San Diego, but we're not now. Okay, um, and by the way, for, for folks, if, if you do have questions, please throw them into the chat box and, and we'll, get, we'll try to get them to you, uh, get the answers to you. Um, also for you, Chris, um, does EAH provide free Wi-Fi throughout the building for residents' use? And are there examples of the structure and a sense of the upfront costs? So we do have at some of our properties, I'd say maybe 30 currently, maybe a little more. And that was through an infrastructure grant through the CPUC. And normally you'd have uh, the cable run to a centralized location, let's say the community room, and then extended with wireless access points throughout the property. So what we hope is about three uh, WAPs or wireless access points per floor to give that Wi-Fi to the, to the residents. I don't have the, the cost for you. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question for you, Tim. I've got a couple actually here. Um, have, uh, does, do any of your plans uh, include battery storage um, and, uh, or, or is, is everything just go straight out to the grid? That's one question. The other question I had is, um, you know, as you're kind of building out, you know, if, as, as you're building out and designing the, the energy efficiency for these buildings, 
do you have some sort of programs that uh, help to encourage residents to conserve energy? I mean, are they aware of the, um, are they aware of the, the ZNE program that, that your buildings are built upon? <laughs> Uh, two great questions, uh, Davis. Question number one on the battery storage. Uh, the state of California is currently, has already rolled out uh, the S-chip rebate program. Uh, and this is, is uh, um, in effect for both newly constructed buildings and existing buildings. So anybody who is not currently planning for battery storage needs to immediately talk to their design teams, whether it's your electro electrical engineer or your solar a designer to make sure that your building gets designed so that you can install the battery. Our approach right now is to design for the battery. Uh, energy gets very expensive uh, starting at about five o'clock to nine o'clock when the sun goes down. So what we wanna do collectively is store enough energy in our battery so that we can service the common areas for those four hours and, and avoid some of the higher peak uh, pay periods. At the same time, the state of California is now talking about a rebate program that I think will launch later this year where they will start paying you to design for resiliency, which means take your battery, find out where your battery is gonna go, and then talk to your, your electrical engineer so that you can wire your community rooms to serve as resiliency hubs in the event of a power outage. So that same four hours of common area energy then could be redirected daily to the community room to keep the lights on, to keep a refrigerator on for people's medications and give people a place to charge phones. Designing for it doesn't cost anything. Being able to then uh, leverage the rebate, put the battery in and then pull conduit from, from there to the community room is something that all affordable housing developers should be looking at. Second question, the resident uh, um, conservation efforts. We use the QAC right now, California Utility Allowance Calculation to help us leverage as much renewable energy as we can buy on site and when we flatten our long-term energy costs for ourselves, for our common areas, we also flatten them for the life of the building for our residents. So we give them to give that to them uh, is part of what we try to build up front, but there's no component in there to allow us to actually communicate with residents yet to see how they're doing with, the, with uh, their actual energy conservation. And it's something that I've been uh, knocking on and there's a couple of grant opportunities we have out there that would allow us then to possibly implement some systems, but it will tie back to guys like David connecting us to really good uh, Wi-Fi systems. So residents can see everything and then maybe Wi-Fi on their phones and stuff like that to allow us to share this information. Because if their utility bills really go from $100 a month electricity down to nine or $10 a month, we want to be able to see that. And if it's not working, we want to be able to work with them on the education front. Okay, great. Tim, um, actually there's another, there's another quick question. Um, what is the uh, minimum roof square footage that makes the use of solar panels cost effective? Well, okay, so there's a couple of things. Anybody who's out there as a developer right now building uh, residential multifamily three stories and less, you don't have a choice. The energy code requires you to have a zero net energy electricity building in the, in the 2019 code cycle. After that, what you really wanna do is manage your architecture and your design team so they allow you to deploy as much PV on your roof as possible. Flat roofs, architectural styles like the one that I have behind me, a project down in San Diego that we built two years ago. This is really important so that you can get this out at a, a massive scale. No amount of roof space is too small, but you, what you don't want to do is have what I call the gingerbread effect, where you get a lot of dormers and roofs and things that cast shadows. Your, your roof is really the engine for driving operational energy efficiency and cost savings. So try to control that up front with your design teams. All right, thanks. Um, I've got a question for, for you, David. Um, you know, you talked a lot about, um, you talked a lot about like how you can, uh, you, you know, when we're undergoing uh, rehab and, and construction, that's like, that's the best time to kind of put in the pipes and, and, and the wiring. But, uh, you, you know, how about for, for those of us who own managed buildings that, that are decades old, that are not up for, for any of the rehab, like what kind of options do they have in, in terms of being able to finance, um, a, you know, a deployment, especially given the, the, expense of, of cabling in center block and, and old buildings? Sure, well, you know, first there's this sort of the, the practical um, 
aspects of this, which is how do you physically um, get the equipment where you need to get the equipment and, and create network infrastructure without tearing open walls and all that kind of stuff that you don't want to or can't do um, <clears throat> in the kind of example you just gave. And certainly uh, Wi-Fi technology gives us the most obvious um, you know, way to, to go about that. You just sort of limit the, the hard wiring uh, to, to, to closets, elevator shafts, basements, things like that, where disruption is minimal and, and, and cost, the capital expenditure is, is minimal as well. In terms of how to pay for that, you know, there's, there are a lot of potential ways to pay for that. I, I, I'm trying not to turn this, this panel into an advertisement for, for our company, but, but certainly um, with some of the ways to, to generate revenue on the back end, you know, we're certainly willing to work with developers to sort of take on uh, a bigger share of the capital expenditure on the front end in exchange for some of the revenue on the back end. But short of that, there are um, uh, uses of funds, um, HUD improvement funds and things like that, private foundation grants and, and other things along those lines, even some preservation funds potentially that can go toward improvements to existing uh, existing buildings and, and and provide that so different different grants both you know public dollars and private dollars that that have done that certainly cupc you know did, did, did a lot of that you know a decade ago yeah and and i think that there's also there, there are also some opportunities possibly with um with the um investment and uh, uh the some of the capital financing institutions that that do land for for development of housing that are interested in supporting broadband efforts and, and building that into into some of the loans and financing for construction. Yeah, and 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 I just wanted to to, to mention on the on the the policy piece you were talking about, particularly, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on the infrastructure um, proposal that the Biden administration has put out. You know, a hundred billion dollars to to connect everybody. Obviously, this is this is a proposal, and um, you know it's got to get through Congress and and, and and all of those uphill battles, and and all the rulemaking, and to see how that sort of shakes out with the different agencies in the federal government and how dollars get dispersed and to whom they get dispersed. Um, I I don't think any of us should look at that and sit back on our laurels and say, okay, the issue is going to be taken care of with this infrastructure bill. To, you know, there have been a couple of articles in the last few days about this as well. You know, in order to get to near ubiquitous broadband connectivity around this country, it's going to take efforts from every sector of society, public, private, nonprofit, and so on. And it's going to take a lot of innovation. And I think the more we can build in <clears throat> um, systems that uh, can actually recoup the costs, if not create revenue, on the, on the industry, such as the members of SCAMP, the actual developers of housing, the more we can build it into those markets, the more we can ensure that this actually happens. And I, I, so I think it's still incumbent on all of us to really look hard about the different ways in which we can make this infrastructure happen on behalf of our own residents. I, I could not agree with you more, David. I think that you know, it's, it's, it's really incumbent upon us too um to be a part of the process and for us to kind of speak up on on the behalf of our residents uh, to promote uh you know not just the infrastructure but all, um you know the hard infrastructure but a soft infrastructure and i think that you know but there there are also there's also the carrot too of, of incentives and savings you know over especially the long term you know as tim had pointed out um in and, and how much you actually can save, you know, in, in your electrical um, expenses. So we're at the top of the hour and uh, I just wanna thank all of you, David, Tim, Chris, this has uh, been an amazing conversation and um, I've learned uh, quite a bit myself. Um, but I want to thank again, all of you for, for participating, uh, for all the SCAMP members for showing up and we appreciate your being a part of this conversation. Thank, thank so you thank so you. much to SCAMP for, for allowing me to be part of this panel. And, and thanks for everyone who attended. I really appreciate it.